Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truini. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Okay, Danny, let's get started. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot, How Doers Get More Done. This week, we have a homeowner asking, can I paint my aluminum siding? Well, you certainly can, but there is a little bit of process involved in it to make it a success. Also, we check in with Chelsea Lipford-Wolf, my daughter, about tips on choosing a paint color for the outside of the house. She has some great tips if you're challenged with that. Also, if your air conditioning system is located in the attic, there's an important maintenance thing you need to check on right now to prevent thousands of dollars worth of damage. Hey, we have some more toilet questions that we want to answer and also deck stain should you stain it or should you leave it alone and if you do stain how often should you stain it we have all of that plus a simple solution Danny, this week I'm going to talk about how to add a cushioned surface to your sawhorses so if you're working on a finished piece you won't scratch it all up that sounds good let's get started here right now we're going to Wyoming John is on the line with a really good question John welcome to the show yeah, thanks. Okay, I've got my sprinkler system set up on an irrigated, you know how the irrigation water comes? and Right. Uh-huh. And I got it pumped into my sprinkler system, and then I water my lawn. So that on a certain part of the house, that water hits the aluminum siding, and then it stains it all up, and I got to clean it off and every year, year in and year out. And, I'm, and I just, sometimes I don't even do it. I got you. But I was wondering, can you paint that aluminum siding? I've never heard of anybody painting aluminum siding. Mm-hmm. Well, I, t- I tell you what, there's a lot of people doing it, and I've done it many, many times. And I remember, heck, this probably 15 years ago, we had a um, aluminum siding house that had the 8-inch wide lap siding, and it was really faded and oxidized. So I did a little bit of research and, first of all, attacked the um, the oxidation by uh, cleaning it well with uh, trisodium phosphate, TSP. And it really came off, and a lot of it was just a lot of powder on it. And I got that off first. And then I went back with a special formulated paint that's an acrylic latex. Now, it used to, Glidden paint was the only one that had it. Now, I think everybody has the um, paint designed for aluminum siding. And then I actually rolled and brushed it on, and it came out great. Naturally, a sprayer would pick up the paste a little bit and maybe make it even smoother. But uh, it definitely can work very, very well. But I would um, I would also um, suggest to you, John, maybe have um, a sprinkler guy, a sprinkler, um, somebody that works with sprinkler all the time come out with their little bitty tools they have to adjust those heads on that because they can uh they can turn back the water a little bit they can adjust it to where it hits in the footprint that it needs to and prevents that because even if you paint the siding if that water is hitting it all the time you're still going to have some signs of that and possibly you know it wearing away some of the paint yeah i guess you're probably right i adjust all my sprinkler heads i i have adjusted them but it's still a little bit hit and i was gonna i was thinking on painting it the same color as the as the like the the water color kind of like getting a little sample and then because it doesn't look that bad if it all looks the same color on them two walls but the rest of the house is <laughs> i like the way it looks but just just the two walls in the backyard i got you yeah well it, well, it definitely can be painted uh there and joe any other thoughts that you would have on um helping john on his paint job there yeah, John, usually when we're talking to someone about painting aluminum siding, they want to paint the whole house, um, which fortunately you don't need to do. But on the other hand, I think matching what you're not painting will be a little bit of a challenge. But cleaning it really well with TSP, and whenever you clean any surface with TSP that you're going to be painting, especially outdoors, you should also wash it with just plain water afterwards, just in case there's any TSP residue left behind. You don't want that affecting the paint. And then we ordinarily recommend a primer. Now, whether or not you need a primer, I can't, I can't tell you over the, over the phone, but ordinarily you would put on a primer and then put on the top coat just so the top coat sticks um, as well as it possibly can to aluminum. So um, you'd have to make that call. But I think, you know, it would certainly solve the problem once you, you know, readjust these sp- sprinkler heads. Because as Danny said, if you're going to keep spraying water on it, you know, you're going to end up with the same issue. If not next year, then soon enough. 
Yeah, I guess you're right. So clean it real good. I was thinking power wash it, TSP yeah, it. Yeah, power washing would be great. Yeah, just don't point up. Always, when you're washing siding, make sure you're pointing directly at it or down slightly because you don't want to blow water up behind the siding, which could possibly happen. Yeah. And then just prime it first and then paint it. Exactly. Uh-huh. And just get to a good paint store. They, they, they've heard this. They've sold a lot of this material for aluminum siding. It's more common than you might think, and uh, and I think you'll be very pleased with it. First of all, as soon as you put that first bit of paint on it, you'll realize, wow, the, the siding does look a little faded because the brilliance of that new paint you'll be very, very satisfied with. So best of luck on everything, John. It sounds like we uh, got you pointed in the right direction. Let us know if we can help you any other way. All righty, thanks a lot. Maybe I'll end up painting the whole house. <laughs> yeah, might might as well. But you can do it just you can do it just one side at a time to make it a uh, you know very easy and so forth. So, um, but uh, thanks so much for being a part of the show today. I want to share with you uh, some lawn tips for summertime because after a long winter, most of us look forward to the warmth of spring, but eventually that'll turn into heat of the summer. And of course, I kind of like it warmer than I like it cold, but you do have to pay attention to it and do a few things different, not only to protect yourself from the heat, but also to protect your lawn. Heat is one of the biggest stresses for a lawn, so it's important that we do everything we can to reduce that stress. Now, obviously, the first step is watering. When it's hot, you get thirsty and of course so does your lawn. If you walk across your grass and it sounds a little crunchy or it stays bent down then it's in real need of water. However you water however you do that watering make sure you do it early in the morning to minimize evaporation and stress to the lawn. Now speaking of walking on the grass that's another thing that causes it stress so try to limit foot traffic as much as possible when it's really hot and dry. Your lawn will thank you for it. Now you, you might think fertilizing is a good idea during this time of the year but even even though fertilizers feed the lawn, they also promote the new growth, which causes stress. So hold off until the weather cools down a little. Finally, cut the lawn in a way that's the least stress possible. That means you should only remove the top third of the grass blades in any given mowing. Now, besides taller grass plants develop deeper roots and it makes it a little more drought tolerant during those hot, dry summer times. Now, this tip brought to you by Xmark, the official mowers of the backyard life. And for more great ideas and inspiration for your outdoors, visit xmark.com slash backyard. You know, so that reminds me something there, Joe, with, uh, with our house and the path between the house and our, our boat dock that uh, originally had plans for some, um, for some flagstone and to put the flagstone in to walk on and so forth. And I thought, well, you know what? I can do that if, if, if a, you know, a pattern forms. So I tell Sharon, I said, look, when you go down there, take a different path every time. So you walk over, you go over this way to the right, the jig over here to the left, and then go down straight, and then you turn. So I think some of my um, neighbors might be thinking Sharon's, um, you know, um, drinking a little wine before she goes down there because she's, she, she, yeah, she's, she's winding, winding her way, her way down. So we laugh about it when, we, when she and I walk down there and everything. Uh, all of a sudden, we'll look at each other. We'll start going this way and going this way. But there's absolutely no wear pattern on my grass, so I'm keeping the stress down during okay. the warmer months. Huh? You'd be wearing out your wife and her shoes but meanwhile <laughs> yeah. the lawn looks great <laughs> Hey, Joe, I wanted to get to this uh, great email that came in from Angela in Georgia. It says, hi, my AC pan ran over and the ceiling in my ba bathroom became very wet. The AC team fixed the issue. Now do I have to, do I need to have the ceiling inspected for mold and will there be any need to replace all of the drywall walls or just the ceiling? What do you think on something like this? Sure heard this story before. Yeah, and I don't think she needs to hire a professional to see if there's any issues, but she needs to, assuming she's capable of getting up into the attic, pulling out the insulation and taking a look. And if any insulation is even damp, I'm not, if it's wet, obviously you have to, but even if it's damp, you have to remove it. Now, sometimes if it's fiberglass, I've actually removed it, put it outside in the sun. And, you know, after several days, it's, and I know it's bone dry. I've actually put it back, but if it's compressed or it's damaged at all, it's probably easier just to replace it. But there's no way to inspect the backside or the top side of this drywall ceiling or to see if it's affected the walls without pulling the insulation out of the way so you can see. And if if the top of the drywall looks damp and is stained a little bit, leaving that insulation off, maybe putting a fan up there if you need to, but that will usually dry out. As, whether, as, far, as far as whether or not there's any mold or mildew, you'll be able to see it if it's there. And then I would try cleaning it up first 
um, with a mold killer remover and without putting the insulation back and then waiting to see. If it continues to grow back, then I would suggest calling in a professional to get it clean because you don't want that mold in there. And he would, he or she would also be able to tell you if their mold has gotten down into the walls, which I suspect it probably hasn't. Usually the ceiling absorbs most of that water and takes most of the damage. Hey, we got a lot of emails this week. I wanted to read one more here. Um, Amy from Ohio writes, We have an unfinished basement that we want to convert into an extra bedroom. My neighbor told me that the building inspector made him add egress windows when they did a similar project. What exactly does that mean? Well, it's a good it's a good question, Amy, and I'm glad you brought it up because it's a, it's a common one, and even though the term egress sounds really technical, the answer is quite simple. If an area is going to be used as a living space, which applies to offices, uh, bedrooms, game rooms. The International Building Code say that the space much must have two forms of egress or escape. One is the stairs that lead down from the main level of the house, and the other could be a door or window that's large enough for you to get out or a firefighter to get in with full gear in the event of an emergency. Because of the walls of a basement are below ground level, there has to be a hole or well outside of each window location. And one of the challenges homeowners face is how to surround this window well so the dirt doesn't collapse into it and they can get out if they need to. Well, one of the best solutions I've ever seen is a product called Scapewell from the Bilco Company. It's made of high-density poly polyethylene, so it's easy to install and requires no maintenance at all. What's really cool is that it has a Terrence or step terrace or step design makes it real easy to climb out of but those terraces also could be planted with flowers shrubs to give the basement something of a view it really is a neat way to handle this real important situation now if you want to find out more about egress windows or the scapewell system check out their website at billco.com joe you and i both have seen those things that's a that's a phenomenal solution to that little problem and the fact that it's made out of a high density polyethylene and you know it's completely indestructible virtually you know you don't have to worry about rusting or rotting so yeah or you don't have to paint it so um yeah and in egress is really important if you don't know you can check with your local building code usually it has to be a minimum opening like windows have to have a minimum opening of about i think it's 20 inches by 24 inches and um with a net clearing meaning the opening has to be at least 5.7 square feet in diameter so the idea is somebody can get through that window including a sure. fireman mm -hmm. wearing all his gear so again, that's BillCo.com. Now we want to shift gears right now and bring in Chelsea Lipford Wolf with checking in with Chelsea. And Chelsea, my producer notes here say how to pick a dang paint color for the outside of your house. Now that would indicate there's been a little frustration and a little effort there. Matter of fact, riding by your house, I think I was up to I think I counted 18 different colors there. Is that right? Um, it was 17. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, how did it work out, and how did your neighbors give you some feedback on it, and uh, are you happy with the color now that it's pretty much complete? Yes, we took a poll from the neighbors. They all um, contributed their opinion, <laughs> um, and yes, the paint color that we ended up with was great, but it was quite a process to narrow down the paint color. Um, of course, being in this field, like I knew exactly what I wanted. I just had trouble finding it, and so I thought, well, hey, there's probably other people who are having trouble picking out a paint color. So I broke down the process that I went through to um, find a paint color, sample paint colors, and test them out on my house before you pay the big bucks for the five and uh, five gallon buckets of paint. Right. I, I know. I tell you, people really get intimidated by picking out colors. You know, picking out colors for a room is one thing. If you really don't like it, you can redo it. But boy, if you get out there and you, you and the guys are spraying paint on, and after three or four hours, if you don't like it, then then it's a much bigger task. So, uh, take us through that process a little bit. Well, of course, the full video is um, on checkinwithchelsea dot com right now. But um, there's so many cool apps nowadays, so you can drive by some of your favorite neighborhoods in your part of the country and take a picture of a house that you like. Then you upload that picture into the app and you pinpoint what color on the house that you like. And then um, they offer you color suggestions based on that color. And then you can go to the store and get a few um, different samples and a you know, variety of shades around that and test it out on your house. And that's the big thing to pick a pink color is to test it out on your actual house and look at it throughout the day for the different types of lighting scenarios that um, your house will be seen seen under. 
and, and also give it a little bit of time because you hate to just, uh, you know, know that the painter's coming tomorrow. And a lot of people do that. You know, well, I know what I want. And then you get out there, get confused, get frustrated. And it's a whole lot better if you can, um, can you know, give it a little bit of time. Come, you know. I would almost recommend you pick out your paint color before you hire the painter. That way you aren't rushed. There isn't a chance of mistakes being made. You have it figured out before they're even on the list to show up. Yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense. And using the apps and being able to, you know, visualize it a little bit there, uh, every one of those little steps will get you more comfort level to do that. And as you said, the the video of this whole process is out is available for you right now at checkinginwithchelsea.com. Well, best of luck on the rest of your day. I know we'll be talking to you soon. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, we'll see you soon. Yeah, that's a that that is something that people go through. You you need to um, check out that video. That'll that'll help you kind of kind of calm down to be able to go through that process and think about it a little bit. It's time for our best new product segment, brought to you by the Home Depot. How doers get more done. Did you know that there are nearly seventeen thousand fires every year associated with clothes dryers? Now these fires cause over two hundred million dollars in property losses, not to mention injuries and fatalities. And thirty-four percent of the time, the cause is just simply the failure to clean your dryer vents. So to do it and to make it easy, we have the drill-powered duck brush from ever built. Now you can use it manually or attach it to your drill for more power to remove lint buildup and debris in your dryer vent as well as other general ducting. It includes a four inch diameter brush head and four different two foot flexible rods that can be used to extend the brush up to eight feet in length. Because the rods are flexible you can work through any of the 90 degree turns so you can clean the duct from either the dryer side or the exhaust outlet outside your home. And to find out more about this product head over to Home Depot Dot com And that's called the Everbuilt Drill Power Dryer Vent Cleaning Kit. Very, very important. It's one of those projects that, uh, you know, you can put off very, very easy. But once you do it one time, you realize there's a lot going on there. You think that, well, I clean the vent in my dryer every time. So where's this lint coming from? Well, I don't know where it's coming from, but it's <laughs> there and it will build up. And, you know, so many times, Joe, you'll have that corrugated or it's not, I guess it's called corrugated piping going now and that really seems to collect that lint sure. more so than a smooth vent that'll allow it to slide right out of there yeah well the reason there's lint in there is because the filter is not 100 percent. you know it's not blocking everything like any filter there's always has to be a little bit of not has to be but a little lint always blows through because the air has to blow through otherwise it wouldn't be a vent that wouldn't be a filter at all It'd just mm-hmm. be an obstruction so yeah and this is particularly a problem by the way if you have a if you have a gas dryer, because gas dryer, of course, is blowing, is is heating, is drying the clothes with with the flame, so you know that's particularly a problem. And I have a brush. I don't know if it's an ever built, but I have one of these. And you can go. I have two ninety uh-huh. degree elbows, and I do it from the outside. And this absolutely goes right through them, like they weren't <laughs> even there. And it burnishes the inside of that pipe. It's like that vent. It's almost like brand new. So this is really a super effective way and a pretty easy way to do it as well. All right, let's go to Michigan right now. Mike's on the line with a deck question. Mike, welcome to the Today's Homeowner Radio Show. Hey, guys. How you doing? Hey, we're doing great. Thinking about doing a little something to that deck out back, huh? I I did it last summer, and I stained it three weeks afterwards with Thompson. Uh-huh. So my question to you is, I hear everybody say, well, you don't have to stain it for another five years. But should, should that be done yearly, or should it be done every two years? Okay. Yeah, I, I would say on the average three to four years, but something that I have found about any kind of staining out, you know, um, wood on the outside of your home, which depends on a lot of factors, how much moisture content you had in the wood, the quality of, of material you put on it, how well you put it on, a lot of things like that play into it. But uh, for the most part, um, once you stain it once, and then you come back, so I would wait a couple years and stain it again. It tends to have even more life after that. And has been my experience is that you may be able to go, you know, four or five years after that. The key thing is just not to let it get too bad looking uh, because that's when you really have a hard time getting it clean and, and getting it back looking like it like it looks now. So um, I would do it on a fairly regular basis, but you certainly don't have to do it every year. If you were going to do it, would you do Thompson, or is there something better out there that you'd recommend? 
Well, um, I haven't really used Thompson's very much. Um, I have used a lot of the Bear products from Home Depot that constantly okay. um, do very well and score high on the consumer um, ratings and so forth. And and another smaller company in, in near and around the Ohio area is Flood Products, and uh, Flood's really a good stain as well. I have a have had a lot of uh, luck with with those. Maybe it's slightly more expensive, but you certainly get what you pay for when you're talking about exterior right. stain. Okay. Well, thanks, guys. Okay, our pleasure, Mike. Get that deck ready for okay. a big summertime. Then. Okay. Thanks. Okay, bye. <laughs> All right. You, you know, that's one of those things, um, Joe, when you're talking about um, – stain or sealer and we talk about it all the time here on the show you know it is very basic you know that you think about the wood is laying out there in the sun the rain the snow the wind and a lot of elements there you just have to get it clean and then get that almost it's almost like moisturizing the dry skin on your hand when you're putting that stain in there it's just going to make it look look um, a lot better longer you're not going to have all of that checking and warping and splinters and that kind of thing uh and if you do it on a regular basis, it's not that big a deal. No, and Mike had a good point as far as like how often you need to do it, but it depends. It's hard to tell. We don't have a, a one answer for that because Mike's in Michigan. Well, what if you live in Texas? You know, is this deck partially in shade or is it in half in the sun? Is it all in the sun? Is it all in the shade? You know, how close is it to the ground? We're assuming it was a pressure treated deck. You know, different woods would require different treatments. And he said he's using Thompson. Are you using the Thompson Clear? water repellent are you using the stain it sounds like the stain so um i would say like any outdoor product you're using the better the product the longer it's going to last and that certainly is true of deck stains um and do not paint it some people ask us about painting we never recommend painting um a wood deck so uh, yeah i would say buy the best stain you can afford semi-transparent by the way not solid color semi-transparent stain apply it clean the deck well apply it as recommended and I would think you'd get at least two or three years of it, as you mentioned. Um, you might get five years if you're lucky, but you certainly don't have to do it every year. If you're only putting down a clear wood preservative, then I would do it every year. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, make it easy on yourself. Use that pump-up garden sprayer and then a big brush just to brush it right in. Summer, it's almost here, but Memorial Day savings are already at the Home Depot. In-store, online, store-wide. Like five bags of garden fresh mulch for just 10 bucks. Save on everything from flower beds to a fresh coat of paint. From power tools to ceiling fans. Ready, set, summer. Memorial Day Savings, here now, only at The Home Depot. How doers get more done. Limit 75 bags per customer. Color selection varies by store. While supplies last, continental U.S. only. Right now, we're going to go to Iowa. We have a lot of friends and listeners up in Iowa, and Brenda's on the line. Brenda, welcome to the show. Hi, Dan. Thanks for taking my call. I have a 15-year-old toilet, and in the last few months, it has been developing a blue discoloration in the bottom of the bowl, and also it is clogging, um, okay, oh, maybe once every week mm-hmm. or two. Mm-hmm. And I did do some research online, uh, and we have had a plumber come as well. He has snaked it, but he, rec- he thought perhaps it was a buildup of, of uh, minerals. Mm-hmm. And I should also tell you that there is a styrofoam la- uh, uh, liner inside the tank to prevent humidity drippage from the outside of the tank. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the top of that is just a slight brown, just at the very top. The rest of it does not appear to me real soil, maybe just a tiny bit. Uh, but what I had read, to, what he had, what the plumber suggested was, he felt if it was, it could be due from to uh, minerals in the pipe that have built up over time, and perhaps uh, a drain expert uh, could come with a longer uh, snake and dislodge that. And I also read about putting three gallons of vinegar in the tank after it's emptied of the water and then scrubbing it with a brush, letting it sit about 12 hours, and then flushing it two or three times. And I'm not sure if that's a good idea as far as would it damage something. Another tip I read about was getting tablets at a home improvement store to put in the tank to prevent this from happening, the, the blue discoloration and the mineral. 
Mm-hmm. Well, well, really, all, all of that advice you're getting is is right in line. Um, I think uh, you're you're right on the right track. Certainly, the vinegar would not um, cause any problems. It's going to you know dissolve a lot of the deposits that you may have in the tank, and then certainly when it is flushed through the bowl, it's going to help clean that as well. But Joe, don't you think on the um, the the clogging up issue here, the blockage uh, may be further down the line. And there, there's, it's not unusual whether it's minerals or, you know, some waste or some different deposits that go down through the toilet that can, can you know, clog up and make a drain line smaller. Uh, that's where the guys with the real drain equipment, the real snakes can really help. Don't you think, Joe? Yeah, Brenda, it sounds like you have two different issues, the blue water and the toilet and then the clogging. And Danny's right. Plumbers, you know, these days, they, they're they not experts or they don't want to be experts at clearing really stubborn clogs because there are specialists, guys, that, companies that just clear clogs. You know, I guess uh, rotor Rooter is probably the most famous one, but there are lots of other companies and, and individuals who do that. And they have special equipment. They usually will do it from a clean out. Um, valve somewhere or a clean out opening maybe in your basement or out by the street um, and they have the special tools to cut through that some of them have a camera they can put inside and find mm-hmm. exactly where the clog is and they can sometimes identify what the clog is but in any case so yeah i would definitely call in a specialist because if you're clo- if you're getting clogs once a week that's you know if it was clogging once every six months is one thing but once a week you definitely have to have somebody come in and regarding the the blue the only reason i know that blue stains appear in toilets is um, acidic water leaching from copper pipes or copper fittings and and that gets deposited in drain openings and toilet bowls and toilet tanks um, and you can remove it from the bowl by um, with ammonia just regular ammonia mix one cup or one and a half cups of ammonia um, one to one with water and then just scrub it use that as a cleaning solution scrub the inside of the tank now that might remove the stain but it's not going to prevent it from returning if copper, if acid, acidic water is leaching out of your copper pipes. And so then what are you going to do? Replace all the copper pipes? Probably not. So what I would do is just clean it. If it comes off, then you'll know that's the, from the copper pipes. And, you know, you would just have to clean it whenever you see that stain. And I would recommend cleaning it more often than not, because if it builds up, then it'll, of course, be more difficult to clean. How about uh, the tablets in the tank? Is that a worthwhile venture? And if so, what type should I get to pre- to help prevent this? I've never used them, and I don't know how effective they are. I guess it can't hurt to try them, um, if, especially if they have some kind of ammonia in them. Maybe that's why they would work. So I guess you could try them. Um, and as far as the styrofoam liner, I don't think that's causing any kind of problems. The the, the brown stain you see on it might just be the water line. Um, mm-hmm. So... Uh, so I think I think that those that's what I would try. You know, if you could remove the stain from the bowl with some ammonia, and then if you want to try the tablets and see if they keep your toilet clean, that'd be great if they do work. Do you have any brand names that you have, or what should I look for in the store? I've never bought them. Yeah, I've never bought them either. I guess if what I would do is go online and just see check reviews. Yeah, I'm not real sure on that, to tell you the truth. I know that there's some that have been around quite a long time, and uh, that certainly wouldn't hurt. It was a good idea, but I think that drain cleaning and getting that expert out there to clean that drain from your house right to the street is going to make a big, big difference, and that should eliminate any blockage at all because that's a characteristic of that type of problem with drain lines, uh, your main supply line, that just periodically things get clogged up in there, and that stops it. So I think that's probably the first step I would do in a little bit of these cleaning methods, I think you'll be in great shape. Ammonia, and you can also use, um, like we'd mentioned before, white vinegar and even a little baking soda to create that um, that strong cleaning action in there. All of that should help quite a bit, Brenda. Uh, should I do the vinegar treatment in the empty water tank first before the, the uh, drain company comes? Uh, it won't matter. They're almost two different two different things that are happening there um, with, you know, that deposits of the water there versus the drain. So um, it wouldn't really matter. I I would just go ahead and do that right now. That'd be very easy to do and then get some of the tablets there that often will change the water blue that goes into the the tank because of the the detergent and so forth in it. So I think you're on the right track and uh, I appreciate you being a part of the Today's Homeowner Radio Show today and certainly hope that points you in the right direction.
Joe, what about a simple solution? Share one with us. Okay, Danny, here you go. Um, saw horses are great when you're cutting plywood or lumber, but when you're using them to support finished pieces, we're talking about doors, tabletops, that kind of thing, you can very easily scratch up the workpiece. So to, to prevent this from happening, all you need to do is get a strip of carpet. Cut a remnant piece of carpet about five inches wide and a little longer, maybe like two or three inches longer than the horizontal rail on the sawhorse. Then you set the carpet on top, centered on the rail, and you press down to conform it to the shape of the, it's usually a two by four on the top of the sawhorse. Press it down, then attach the carpet with a few staples driven through the sides of the rail. That's important. Go on each side. Don't staple at the top because if the staples work loose, of course, they're going to wind up scratching up your workpiece. And if you go to todayshomeowner.com slash simple solutions, you can see a video of this simple solution right now. Yeah, that's something I always can never throw away. That little roll of carpet that was left over. It's amazing how many times you can use that to, you know, protect things. I even have used it for applying stain, um, and it works better than that um, homeowner that called the other day. It said the, the <laughs> wife was using a cat. It looked like a cat, which was just kidding. It looked like she used a cat to apply it. Yeah, don't use a cat. Yeah. Now it's time for our podcast question of the week. This comes in from Nancy in Maryland. Is there a way I can bring up cool basement air to the upper living level during summertime? The air is always a lot cooler in the basement, you know, cooler than anywhere else in my house. I'm just curious to see if this was possible. Joe, I thought that question was excellent because you think about the multi-level home. You think about if it's a traditional two-story home with a basement, you go down to the basement and it's immediately cooler and more pleasant. You go up the stairs, you can feel the heat increasing, but I've never thought about that. First thing I think about that you don't want to do is pump all of that humidity that most basements have into any area of your home. But have you ever heard of anyone doing any kind of exchange of air like that? Yeah, the challenge, of course, is that cool air sinks and hot air rises. So you have all that cool air, whether it's coming from your house or just from your basement, settling into the lowest levels. And if it's if it's, your basement is humid, then yeah, you don't want to do that. I happen to live in a house with a full basement and in the back of the house, it opens to the outdoors and it also opens to the garage. So it's pretty dry down there. I've been here over 25 years and it's very dry and it is so much cooler. I mean, it feels like it's 20 degrees cooler. I'm not sure how much cooler it is, but it's beautiful when you go down there. Um, and the only way that I know that you could do this, I don't know if there's some other way, but they, they make... Um, they're called register booster fans. Mm-hmm. They're essentially a floor vent that are typically hooked up to a heating or cooling duct to help bring that hot air or cool air into the room more. Um, if it's not, you know, if it's not strong enough, if if it's very far from the from the unit, maybe you're not getting as enough pressure, so you can put these little booster fans. They're about four inches by twelve inches. You cut them into the floor. Well, if you cut one of these into the, into the floor and hook it up to an electrical circuit and it's not hooked up to a duct work, and it's open directly to the basement, it'll be blowing that basement air up into the living space. So that'd be one way to do it. And there are two, basically two different types of booster fans. Some have a blower wheel, and some have um, like a propeller type fan, like a prop type fan. Um, the blower wheels are about 50% quieter. So you don't want to hear this thing running all the time. So I would, if you're going to do this, I would get the ones with the blower wheel. Um, but that would be the only way I know to get the air from the basement up into, and of course that would only work on the first floor because the basement's directly below the first floor. But that, that would work. Um, how effective is it? It's a 4 by 12 inch vent, I'm not sure, but um, it would certainly be better than not having it at all. Yeah, it's, that's interesting, because I could envision, though that probably is fairly difficult in most homes, to have, let's just say you had an 8-inch duct running from right. the basement a ceiling and just straight up through a closet or somewhere that you can hide yeah. it and then that deposits the air to the top and then you have a nice fan below that you're able to control and turn it on that it boosts that air straight up i just from from the physics standpoint of it um is that heavy cool air going to be able to be moved vertically which could conceivably be 25 feet right. and if so how many how much of the cooling are you losing as it's going up to there i don't know that's a that's a great question nancy i'm glad you posed that and if anyone's listening to this podcast that may have some experiences along these lines and we'll check with some of our air conditioning um, expert friends but uh, let us know what you have and if you have a question for us let us know that right now today's homeowner.com slash 
podcast. Thanks so much for listening to this podcast this week, and we certainly appreciate the continued wonderful five-star reviews that we're getting here on the Today's Homeowner Podcast. I'm Danny Lipford, along with my buddy Joe Truini. Thanks so much for spending some time with us.